Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zed from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I'm back to see a good buddy of mine, Lee Stoffer. Lee, how are you doing? I'm good Zed, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. So this video is a continuation of a series I'm filming with Lee in his workshop here in Milton Keynes. And what this series is about is covering a whole variety of sheaves, specifically for varieties of spoon stroke hook knives. Now, if you haven't seen the previous videos, I will put links below to those. And what this video in particular is going to be looking at is looking at a style of leather sheath that's only going to work with certain styles of spoon knives. Now what those styles are we're going to cover in a moment. So what we're going to do first we're going to look at an example of Lee, uh, of Lee that has completed one before and then what we're going to do Lee's going to then talk about the styles of spoon knives specifically that it will work for. Now we are going to also cover a couple of nuances as well just in case you don't have the leather or whatnot but this video is a guide to kind of making a style like I said for a certain type of spoon sheath but also uh, this is essentially a bit of a beginner's guide to leather working as well. Yeah it's pretty basic. Yeah, using some basic tools. Uh, Lee's very proficient when it comes to leather work, but when it comes to this particular video, he's gonna simplify things as much as possible. The whole idea with this entire series is to focus on techniques as well as tools that most of you will have available. Now granted with leather work, there will be the kind of maybe one, two or three tools that are very specific to leather working. But in, as a general theme for this entire series, we're trying to simplify things. So you see Lee has a fully equipped uh, workshop here. Even when it comes to leather working, he's fully set up. However, in the kind of preparation for this video, Lee, as much as possible, try to simplify things. So without further ado, Lee, with your kind permission, we'll crack on. Let's go for it. So guys, hope you enjoy the rest of this video. Okay, so what we're going to look at today is this type of leather pouch sheath for a spoon knife. Um, and this is really for a specific type of spoon knife. Um, this is a really small scorp that I made years ago just as an experiment. Doesn't get a lot of use anymore, but I wanted to make a leather sheath for it, like a conventional knife sheath. So like this would be something fairly conventional where you've got the leather that wraps around the handle and the blade and, and aims for a, a friction fit. Obviously, when you've got a tool with a, a bigger end on it, it's not a flat blade, so you can't just fold the leather in half and, and jam it in. So the addition with this is this little bit on the end that we've folded over and sewn into place to give it a bit of capacity. Um, so this will work with a fully looped blade, because the principle of how it works is the blade pushes in past this kind of pinch point here, and then the blade is what actually kind of locks it in to the sheath. There's no sort of danger of, of cutting the stitches because it's not the, that's not the sort of blade that will do that but in the same way the, the, the edge of the blade points down towards the stitch and if you put it in sideways although it would go you're going to end up rubbing the edge on the leather so it goes in like a conventional knife would into the sheath like that. Now this will work with some types of hook knife as well. If we take our old our old moor here this as you can see, doesn't come quite all the way round. So what will happen is, if we try and put this type in to this type of sheath, it's gonna go in so far, and I could force it, but I wanna be able to get this out again. When I try to pull this out, it's kind of hanging up on the fact that this point doesn't come back on itself. So what we kind of need is for that to effectively come round a little bit further. If the hook came round so it was back on itself, then the wide point would do the same job as the as the, as the looped blade and push all the way in and actually spread the leather apart. So you need a hook that's sort of like more extreme than that. Some makers make a hook that comes back on itself a little bit. So like almost three quarters of a, of a loop. And that, that would work with this type of sheath. But so what we're gonna work with today is the more standard size of scorp that I make. I switched to making these wooden boxes for several reasons, which there's no point going into the detail of, but that's what I make now. But just as a as a retrospective thing, there are obviously other makers of these sorts of tools out there now that maybe don't supply any kind of edge protection with them. I don't know, but if you are in need of some edge protection or you prefer a leather sheath over the wooden box, this is kind of an option for you. So that's what we're going to look at today. And this is a leather one. One of the things I've found working with leather is you need to make a template. So in this case, this is a, a cardboard made out of an old cereal box. It's really thin. It, it's great for actually marking things out, but 
with any leather work, we've got to work out how big the sheath needs to be. And this is where a template comes in. I used to be a floor layer, so I've got lots of offcuts of vinyl flooring and old sample books that I've used. So I, for templating, vinyl flooring, um, some people will call it lino. This is, this is a, like a more modern version of it. Lino is a bit more of an old school product. This is really quite flexible. It's got this, this vinyl back and a kind of a hard outer wear layer that gives it similar properties to leather in the way it feels, the thickness of it. So it's a brilliant, you know, cheap templating material for doing stuff like this. You can work things out with it before you transfer the pattern onto leather. So that's what I use. I've even got, so for a little set of detail knives that I made there, I need to remake this in leather, but this was just an idea for a three pouch sheath for different designs of detail knife. So I've done it in vinyl first, just to refine the design. Started off just sort of stapling it together and a bit of masking tape, and then put a few stitches in it just to make sure it's gonna hold. And actually, it's proved pretty tough. So if you haven't got leather, you might have some offcuts from having some floor laid. If you go to a, a flooring shop, they've almost certainly got books of samples of discontinued vinyl, or you could just buy a small, a small strip of it and you could use that instead. It's not ideal, but it's not a bad, again, if you're looking to use up some scraps, or you want to practice, it's probably a lot cheaper than buying the leather that we're going to use. The leather we're going to use today is a vegetable tanned leather, so it's plain, undyed. It's, it's flexible but not too flexible, you know, it wants to have a little bit of memory to it. Um, and it wants to be of a reasonable thickness. This is around about three millimetres thick, so two and a half to three mil is an ideal sort of thickness of leather for this project and most other knife sheets. I, I generally, I think it's normally sold by weight, um, so it'll be like X amount of ounces, and I can't actually remember off the top of my head, but if you can, if you can measure it, if it was calipers or, you know, or a ruler, this is gonna be, let's start it on 100 mil, it's actually just over three millimeters thick. So about an eighth of an inch. And that's gonna, that's gonna make for the right kind of material for the job. Right, so the next thing we're going to look at is the tools that we're going to need to actually do this job. And to keep it really simple, I'm going to use what I consider to be kind of like the basics. Um, the first thing we're going to need is a suitable knife to actually cut the leather. Uh, I've tried various ones. I've found that, uh, you know, a basic utility knife that uses a fairly standard Stanley blade. This again, this is one of my old floor laying tools. So it's got a quick release mechanism for getting the blade in and out. But anything that takes this type of blade is going to work. They're quite a thin blade. They come reasonably sharp. What I would all, always recommend when you're doing leather work with these, and, and actually in general, depending on if you're going to abuse it or not, to get a cleaner, more efficient cut is to actually strop these blades first. Um, so we'll just quickly look at that. I've got my normal strop mounted up in the, in the vise here. We've got a flat blade with a bevel on it, so lay it flat, stand it up onto the bevel, bit of pressure with the finger and just draw it backwards across the strop, flip it over, do the same thing. Probably half a dozen passes is going to make all of the difference when it comes to cutting through leather, which is an inherently quite resistant material to being cut, which is why we use it for containing sharp edges. So just a few strokes like that just to refine the edge of that blade that you know, isn't particularly refined from the factory. It's plenty sharp enough for most tasks, but this just makes our life a little bit easier when it comes to leather work. So that's now ready to work with. The other things we're gonna need are these two tools are particularly useful for leather work. Not essential, but in this job, quite useful. This is an edge beveler. So it's got a little notch in it there and a polished surface there, and its, it's basic purpose is to bevel the edge of the cut leather. So you push it along and it like takes off a triangular section and leaves us with a nice bevel on the edge. This helps a, when we want it to form a round, round edge on the leather and also specifically for a part of this sheath that wants to be beveled to fit together properly. So we'll look at that. Um, you don't have to have it, you could, you know, technically hold the edge of the knife on the bench and try and pull the leather through it and try and take that bevel off by hand. It's not going to be particularly easy, it's going to vary. So again, not an expensive tool, really worth having if you're going to do, you know, any leather work at all really. The other thing is a groover. When we are stitching leather with this type of thread, 
um, it helps to be able to recess it. So where this sheath here, you can see that the leather is, the, is recessed so that the stitching sits with inside a little groove. So if, when the outside of the sheath gets rubbed, the stitching doesn't rub through and wear. So this thing works on this little post, rides up against the edge of the leather, and it's basically got a tiny little hole drilled through it. Again, it's sharpened and polished on this edge. So you hold that post against the edge and you can basically cut out a groove for the stitching to sit in. This is adjustable, so if I loosen this nut off, we can slide this bar in and out to cut the groove a varying distance from the edge. So if you wanted to do a double layer, you could set it at that distance and move it out and do another one. The beauty of this is when you're working around the perimeter, so if we want to come down this side, we can guarantee we're going to get it the same distance from the edge down this side. You can also get freehand versions of this. I prefer this guided one. Then we're going to need something to stitch it up. Um, well, in fact, before that, we're going to need something to poke the holes for the stitches. So this is a conventional kind of saddler's awl. It's diamond shaped in profile. If you cut that blade in half, you would see it be diamond shaped, but obviously it runs to a point. This helps to lock the stitches in. You could also, if, if you don't want to buy one of these, which I would definitely recommend for leather work, you could drill holes. The beauty of this is it doesn't remove any material. It just penetrates through the leather and creates a diamond shaped hole. So if this is our stitch line, it's slightly longer in one direction than the other. We want to run the longer direction in line with the stitch line. And then this is just a piece of hardboard with some cork on the surface of it. You could also use just a, a champagne cork. But I find I like to have this flat on the bench, stand the all up, put the point where you're going to want to make the hole, just press it through and hopefully, if I pull that out, you should be able to see that slightly diamond shaped hole. And what happens is when you pass, it gives it room for the needle to pass through the middle. And then when the stitch actually comes through there, the thread will lock in to the point of the diamond. So it's just an extra way of the stitch being secured. So once we've poked the holes, we'll need suitable needles and a suitable thread. This is a waxed um, cotton thread. In fact, it might even be a synthetic, I can't say for sure, but it's waxed anyway. It's, it's quite nice for it to be waxed, for it to, to flow through the leather nicely. And these are saddler's needles. It might be difficult to pick up on the camera, but they've got a very small, strong eye for where they're being pulled through quite tight holes. More conventional like darning needles or sewing needles are not really robust enough. These are also not particularly sharp. If you, you know, if you, slip they're gonna they're gonna go into your skin but they're not designed to pierce a hole that's why you use the awl first so they're yeah, your, your basic leather working tools in my opinion you can get all sorts of fancy gadgets for marking out accurate stitch patterns and stuff but really i think they're the basics so now we've discussed the tools we've discussed alternatives and templating materials i think the only last thing is the material itself this is a a piece of leather I just want to show you as an example has been exposed to the sun now obviously leather is skin and in the same way that we can catch the sun so can leather even after it's been processed so this is a, an undyed unfinished leather and you can see basically it's lighter here and darker here this edge has been exposed to a bit of sunlight so it's always best to keep your leather wrapped up so I always keep my leather in a place where there's not a lot, not a lot of natural sunlight this particular workshop hasn't really got any windows or access to it and I always keep it wrapped up in brown paper you know wrap the edges over stick it up on a high shelf where it's not likely to get exposed to sunlight if you have it just rolled up or folded over on itself you'll get the shapes of where it's been folded you would effectively get tan lines on the leather so it's worth bearing that in mind when it comes to storage so yeah let's look at marking this up and actually making something out of it now Okay, so what we need to do is to work out, like I said before, a template for how big and what shape this, the shape that we need to cut out of the leather is going to be. You could use cardboard, you could use the vinyl flooring. Eventually, obviously, we're gonna use the leather. Now, there's some basic rules of templating. If we use a straight knife to demonstrate, these are a couple of different patterns of straight knife sheets that I don't use anymore. But you can see the basic shape of a knife has been drawn on there. 
We're going to start with the centre line. So if you wanted to start a template, maybe start with a, a scrap piece of, just a blank piece of paper, draw a straight line down the middle. You can see this has got one mark down it here. So if I just colour that in, you see it a bit better. So you want to lay the kind of knife on its back straight down the middle. Now we don't really need to worry about the blade other than the length. It's the handle width we're worried about or concerned about. So we're going to draw a line down either side of that just to give us a position. Then we roll it over and line the, the back of the blade up, the back of the handle up with the outside line there. Draw another line here. Then roll it the opposite way, line that up. Draw another line here. So for a straight blade, straight bladed knife, that's going to give you the basic size of a template. Then we're going to add a thing called a welt. Now for a straight knife, a welt is an extra piece of material, an extra slice that we cut that's just the shape of the outside that we're going to sew in to this gap here. So you can see it here as a slightly different colour. Okay, what that does is it actually from a straight knife going in, it helps to protect the stitches from being cut. You can imagine if you put that in at a bit of a funny angle, you could just slice your way straight out. So the welt helps to protect the stitches. Now because we're not introducing a sharp edge on this knife towards the stitch and even though we're going to load it into the sheath the same way there's no fear of it actually cutting the stitches so we don't need a welt for this but what the welt will do is actually bulk out the actual width of the sheath there which is why we don't need to add on if we think we've measured the back and the sides of the handle the welt kind of gives you that capacity for the bottom part of the handle to sit in there and nicely just swell out to the widest part of the handle so that's one way of doing it, that layout method. Another way of doing it, if you want to measure accurately the material that you're using, because obviously if you're using a piece of cardboard it's much thinner and less flexible potentially than the leather itself. If you get a strip of the material that you're using, find where you want the actual thing to register, where it wants to sit into, and just wrap it round and pinch it tight, right, and just mark with a, with a thumbnail where the bottom of the handle is on both sides and then if we just put a little mark there actually I'm just going to mark that with a pen so it's more obvious for the camera effectively if we were to measure that distance plus the thickness of the welt we're going to get the width that we where we want it to register in so that's another way of taking a quick measurement with the actual material that we're going to use but say so we're not making a sheath for us for a straight bladed knife but that will give you the basic ideas of that this is what we're going to make a sheath for. So we've got to allow this capacity here, which is where this extra piece comes in. This kind of rugby ball shape bit on the end is what we're going to stitch these sides together and then bring this round. And what that does is actually effectively pushes these bits out to give us this capacity for the blade to sit into and make this more of a pouch kind of thing. So this template here is specific to this type of tool and remember the tool is not going to fit in it like that it's going to fit in it like that so this kind of pinch point here is what allows it to basically push the widest part of the blade past that point and then it shrinks back in a little bit and holds it in where it wants to sit it also helps if it fits quite snugly around the handle but that's not so important on these they so say this is a bit baggy at the handle end but where it pinches in there it's kind of pinching the blade the leather is doing what my fingers are doing so that the blade doesn't just fall out. It's a little bit of tension there just to stop it from falling out. You can kind of hear as it drops in past that point. So that's the template that's for this. We will, I know Zed's going to probably do a blog post to go along with this. So what we'll do is we'll take some, some photographs and maybe sketch this out on a piece of paper just to give you an idea of the kind of shapes that you want to make. But you, you might have to experiment a little bit to make this specific to the type of the type of knife that you are gonna they're gonna house in this but this whole method of folding that piece in to give you that capacity this is where you might need to make that a little bit wider or a little bit longer or make this pinch point a little bit deeper just to suit the kind of knife that you're working with but this will hopefully give you a basic idea of the of the tools required and the techniques that you're going to have to use to achieve the result that would be great so just to recap then it's very kind of you lee so i'll take a few pictures of the template yeah um, and like Lee said, I typically do a blog post for every video. So I will link to that in the description um, and that will just give you an overview, like a general guide to work with to suit your particular knife.
Okay, so we're at the point now where we're going to mark out our template. There's various things you could use to mark the leather. A pencil will kind of work. A biro is by far the best thing I've found. What I would normally do is mark on the, the back of the leather rather than the front because what this what biro ink actually does to leather is apparently imparts some chemical change. So there's no removing this once it's on there. So we want to mark the line and basically cut the line off. So if we do it on the back, so it would be if, if there is any remnants of the marking left will be on the inside of the sheet. So I'm just going to lay this out as efficiently as I can. So nearly touching the edges, but with something to actually cut. And then I'm going to draw around it. So I'm just going to pin it down, pin that part and start in the point. I'm going to actually put a point in each position just with the tip of the pen and then come round these shapes just trying to make sure nothing moves while I'm doing it. So just as a recap while you're doing that, yep. for those watching the process to follow is make a template first with either a cardboard or lino, yep. make sure you're comfortable yep. with how it goes before you're attempting this basically. That's it. Yeah, I would try and get some gauge that what you're, you know, what you're cutting out is actually going to work because sometimes you can cut things that are a bit on the big side. You can generally rescue that, add in a couple of extra stitches. If they're too tight, you might be able to kind of wet the leather and stretch something in. But as long as, you know, as, long as you're reasonably close, you should be okay. But so we've got our mark of the shape that we need to cut. Now, remember, we stropped this blade, so that will make it as easy as an experience of cutting is likely to be. I always try and cut through the leather in one pass. If you've got a sort of hack at it, you're gonna get a rough finish on the edge. Um, again, I've got a bit of experience with knives. It's probably worth practicing on a similar material like your vinyl flooring. It, it has a similar resistance to the cut. Always put a cutting surface down on your bench. Well, if you care for your bench at all. I don't really want to put loads of cut marks in mine so I've got this bit of scrap hardboard down and I'm actually going to start in a point and just push the knife into that point so I'll make sure I get right in there and actually going to do that on both sides just so I know that I've got all the way through and in. Now this knife has been stropped should cut nice and clean so the first thing I'm going to do is come around this kind of rugby ball shape bang on the line just following with the tip take your time follow the line and come out to a point same on this side, come in, sometimes putting your thumb down, I'll turn around and do that, putting your thumb down as a bit of reference and then the knuckle of this finger down helps to just keep me guided so I can just put some effort into pulling the knife and steering it without the chance of it skidding around too much. So again, come to a point, hopefully I've come all the way through, actually I've missed a tiny bit on this side, so I didn't press quite hard enough, so I need to recut this and this is what I generally try and avoid. So put a fair bit of pressure down on your first go so that you actually get all the way through. Um, now we're going to work around this curve and it, sometimes it's difficult to sort of move this material around sometimes and continue the cut. So you might have to work in sections but always try where possible to start and finish a cut all the way around. If I have to come around here and I've got to move I could just keep the knife in place, move the leather around a little bit, keep coming around that curve. Plenty of pressure down, move the leather around a bit more. Coming into this little bite point there. And you see I'm trying to cut right through the line basically. And I'm going to come all the way out there and hopefully that's gone all the way through. Same round this way. While you're doing that, does it matter on the thickness of leather that you use? I, I say this is the this thickness is the one that I've found to be the best for this purpose. You, I've, I've made sheaths out of thinner leather. You don't get it much thicker. Um, you can get extreme sort of leather with properties that are much thicker than this, but you know it's not going to be the right type. Vegetable tanned leather is what I've found to be the best for this job. I just missed a little bit on the inside here as well. So there's a tiny bit hanging on there. So that's got through. So now all we've got to do is trim this, this top edge. But yeah, so this sort of two and a half to three mil is the thickness that I would recommend going for for the 
for the properties that it, it gives the overall job. So we've got our, our general shape and at this point there's some things that we can do while the material is still flat that are going to be much easier than when we've kind of formed it into the shape that we're going to use it for stitching. One of those things is cutting the groove for the stitch and in this case where this just missed a bit there so I'm going to just trim that back very carefully so where this piece sits into these pieces you can see if it's all square on the edge it's going to be quite bulky so this is where that little beveler comes in so I'm going to take that and then what I want to do I've marked it on the template here you can see there's two little lines so what I effectively want to do is fold this into itself until I get to the point where I know that that bit that's folding is going to end. I'm just going to mark that with a thumbnail. Okay. Same on this side. Bend it round until the point touches. Mark it with a thumbnail. So they are the, those are the bits that I want to bevel. So from that point there, I want to bevel round right into that point there. And then I want to bevel the same from the other side, but I'm going to try and come from the inside this time. So I'm just lifting that up slightly, get the beveler in, and then push it around that corner and take that little bevel off. But stop at that point, because at that point, the leather's actually going to be touching itself square. So then this is the last part that needs to be done. It might help to kind of elevate this a little bit, maybe, but maybe not. If you can put it on the, on the edge of something, Sometimes it's going to help you just to get right into that corner. So just propping that up off the bench a little bit so I can get right in. And a couple of passes won't hurt. You know, this is not an exact science. You can go again if need be. It's just going to have less to locate on. Same again on this side. I'm going to bend that out the way as much as possible. Get in as tight as I can with the beveler. Just come around that edge. Okay, so you can see now we've just beveled all of these edges. So when they sew together, it will just be a, it gives it basically a bit more of a contact surface. So just to stress, this is the inside of the leather. This is on the inside face, yes. What we will do is bevel the outside faces. Now, at this point, this top part, we can bevel the inside and the outside, and then use a tool that I've not mentioned yet. But it's easy enough to buy or make. This is a, a burnisher. So this one's actually set up so I can put it in my lathe and do this a bit quicker. But interestingly, the best thing for polishing the edge of a leather is saliva. It's got enzymes in it that actually affect the leather. So best thing you can do I thought, I thought you were gonna hold is, is lick it, <laughs> pick the appropriate size groove and then just scrub this. And if I just do half and see what happens. So now we've got a nice shiny smooth surface there and a rougher one there. But that whole beveling process is what enables it to then turn it into a nice rounded edge. So again, while this is flat, you can do it off the edge of a bench just to help support it. But you're gonna to have to rub it backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards as fast as you can really until it takes, so we're building up a little bit of friction and a bit of heat here, which gives it that nice polished smooth finish. It makes it a bit more durable as well. But you can wet it with water, it does not have the same effect as your saliva. It's definitely by far the best thing for the job. So that's that. Next thing we're going to do is cut the grooves for the stitching. And again, there's two different ways of doing this. This one, I've cut the groove all the way around to the edge and gone in with a saddle stitch. We're going to do a slight variation on this just so I can show you an alternative stitch, which is where we're going to cross over on the outside here. So in the same way that I've only beveled to this point, I want to come around with a thumbnail just on the outside, mark where I want to cut the groove to. So that little mark I've made with my thumbnail, which will get covered up by the stitching anyway, is where I want to come to with my groove. So I'm going to start the groove about five millimetres from the top. You're running this part of the tool against the edge of the leather. And this, is, this helps if the leather's not been beveled at this point on the outside, which we can do. Come right round to that mark and then just rock it out. This way, because it's a tool that only really works in one direction, I'm gonna start from the mark, follow it round the bend, and then come out about five millimeters from the end again. 
okay so we now got a, a groove down each side now at this point some people if you've got more of a selection of leather working tools you might have a pricking wheel which is basically like a roller with spikes on it that you would start at this beginning point roll down and it will show you it will, it will roll and give you it, like governed spaces you get different pitched ones so they give you a space between the stitches and that way you can roll down one side start from the same point roll down the other side and you know you can actually poke the holes through first and then when you fold it up they're going to line up cheap alternative to that <laughs> would be a dining fork as long as your your tines are all fairly straight effectively you can start at one point put it on there and rock it into that space and make some little dents. That's effectively what a pricking wheel will do for you. And then obviously, if these are reasonably evenly spaced, we can put the first tine on the last hole, do that to mark it. And again, just rock that in. And that, that will give us marks while stitching. And we could go down the other side. That's not how I do it. I'm not saying there's a right or a wrong way. I've not really been taught leather working. I've developed my own ways of doing it like I do with most things. So what I normally do at this point We've done all the work that needs to be done flat. We've cut that groove, we've cut those bevels, we've refined this top edge. They're all really difficult jobs to do once it's folded in half. Now at this point, what I would normally do, and this may or may well not be suggested by proper leather workers, <laughs> is I use a bit of PVA glue, just run it down that edge. Don't need, a, don't need an awful lot, just kind of smudge it in with another bit of there they don't try not to get too much of it actually on the outside edge because you don't want to see it or it play apart but just a little bit down there and then I would actually fold this over line it up get rid of any excess on the outside then I use as long as you've got clothes pegs that haven't got really sharp some clothes pegs have little lines in but these have got nice silicone pads on so they're great little quick clamps for leather working and I would leave this make sure the top edge is lining up there Put some pegs on. And so what are the reasons for the gluing? Well, to my mind, there's, there's, say, there's different ways of doing it. You can go through, if you imagine this was had a welt in it as well, you'd have three thicknesses of leather to go through with the awl. So it's quite difficult to keep it straight. It's definitely easier to push the awl through one thickness of leather. Two thicknesses isn't too much of a problem. So what I tend to do is glue this in place so that when I poke the holes through with the awl, I've got the surfaces stay in line with each other okay it helps me find the groove on the back so I'm going to poke through from the groove on the front and if this is all stuck together in line it helps me to find the groove on the back but I just want to make sure that everything's nicely lined up because we've cut the shape specific for the job and then we again like we did on the wooden version we're just going to let that glue set up for about an hour and then that will be that will be fine to come back and punch the holes for the stitching This is all set up now. We can take these pegs off and that is glued together firmly enough, not that we could wedge a tool in it and it won't split, but firmly enough to hold it for the stitching. Um, so we're gonna look at the way that we're gonna punch the holes and do the stitching now. This is the ideal time actually, if there's any discrepancy between the two surfaces, you can get your nicely stropped utility knife blade and just carve back any little bits that might be standing proud. This is the ideal time to do that when there's no stitching in the way to cut. We don't want to cut too deeply because we don't want to throw this, this line out too much. We want to aim for hitting the groove on both sides, but just to even it up anywhere where that's standing proud. That template's hand cut, so there's every chance it's not perfectly symmetrical. If you had, a, if you had the um, access to some kind of um, sort of like drawing program on a computer, you could almost certainly improve the template making process by drawing half the template, then mirroring it to get it perfectly symmetrical. Um, but that's that trimmed up anyway. We've got no discrepancies there now. This bit will pop into there, but we're not worried about this bit yet. We've got two things that we've got to do. We've got to punch the holes in this line for that stitching and then round the corner. I do this in two stages. We've got two options. So this is one that I've continued what's called saddle stitching all the way round and you can see it kind of pinches it in here and the stitches are visible on the inside and the outside. This one is something that I had a little play with years ago. It reminded me of a, the way they stitch up um, 
baseball gloves and I just quite like the look of it. So you're going for an, in like an external cross stitch there. So you're going to saddle stitch all the way down here and then flip. That will become apparent why that's possible, the way that we do the saddle stitch. This is the one that we're going to do today, just so I can show you the two different styles of stitching. But to begin with, we're going to punch some holes in this. Now, on this side, we can see where we started marking it with the old fork. I might as well use those to go with. But we're going to take the awl. This is my cork surface. So I'm going to poke it in on that first dot and I want to try and keep this nice and vertical so I'm going to get right over the top of the tool poke it straight through as I possibly can using my finger as a bit of a guide and I don't want to go too far through and I just want to make sure that where the point of that all is coming through I'm in the groove okay and this is the downside in some ways to poking through the full thickness it's very easy for it to wander if you can look there this slides very slightly higher than that side so it's easy for the all to wander once you get a feel for it you should find the groove pretty easily so again just make sure that we're actually in the groove with the point very point of the all then push it all the way through give it a tiny little wiggle and out she comes and you can pre pretty much see daylight through that hole but there's no material been removed it's just been forced apart by the all so now we're going to carry on down there these stitches on that um, where I've marked it with the fork are roughly about five six millimeters apart and actually if I was just going to eyeball this which is how I normally do it that's about the frequency I'd go. You don't want them too close together, which is why I never bothered going for the, the pricking wheels, because they all seem to put the stitches, the ones that I saw anyway, put the stitches a bit too close together. If you notice on this sheath, they're really quite close together. When you're punching with this all, the fact that it's cutting a little bit like a knife blade, if the stitches are too close together, what you'll do is, when you pull the cord tight, or the, the, sorry, the stitching thread tight, you can pull through the actual gap between the stitches. So I like a decent gap between my stitching personally. So I'm just gonna follow the old fork marks. Okay, occasionally, once you've got a feel for it, you can pretty much just go for it, but make sure that you're in the groove on the back. The alternative is, I've done this before as a bit of a cheat. You cut the groove on one side, poke through with the awl, and then the groove on the back because you can kind of deviate very slightly to catch them all but it's far better just to get in the get in the zone you'll build up a little bit of muscle memory for this eventually and then you can just kind of go for it and I'm gonna just keep checking check every other one maybe try and keep it nice and straight up and down So I've got to the point now where I've run out of marks that I made with the fork. So we've got a reasonably even stitch. And then you can see the frequency is quite even that way. But you know, generally your eyes are going to be good enough. Just follow it. It shouldn't be too difficult to sort of follow that gap. What can be quite useful, I've found, is work out where you want your last stitch to be when you've got about halfway. You work out where you want your last stitch to be because what you don't want is to get right to the end and have a massive gap or too small a gap. So then I'm going to work backwards with a similar spacing for a few. So then I can just visually, when they get quite close together, when I get to a point where there's just like a, an inch or so between the stitching or between the holes, So I'm having to lean the awl a little bit on this side where I trimmed some of this leather back to make it flush with each other. It's sent the holes, it's sent it slightly wonky. So to find the slot, I've had to lean in a little bit. Don't try whatever you do and bend the awl while it's in because you're quite likely to break the point off of it. But you can see now we've got an inch and a half or so gap between them. So now's the time to maybe just use the tip of the awl just to try and mark roughly where you're going to put these next ones so you can make sure that if there's going to be a massive gap like there then maybe we put two in and then space them ones back out a bit more so i've given myself just some little guidelines to go on so this is where maybe one of the little pricking wheels might save you a little bit of time it certainly cost you a few quid your money to buy one and generally you might, you might find that you want a selection of them to give you different pitches. So I've always just eyeballed this. So on the first couple of sheaths I ever made, I didn't even have an awl. 
um, I didn't even have the right needles, but I got by. I had flush stitching, no groove cut, and I actually drilled the holes with a, with a small like one and a half millimeter drill bit. It's still together to this day. It's not the ideal way of doing things. So we're gonna put three in this space here. And these are gonna be a slightly closer together than the rest, but hopefully it'll blend in quite nicely. Do be careful when you're sort of pulling this tool back out that you don't <laughs> inadvertently sort of pull it too hard and then try and counter that because you, you're likely to stab yourself <laughs> and they are very very sharp obviously they're designed to penetrate skin um, so there we go you can see that on the back the diamonds are not quite so visible if you really wanted to go mad with it you could go back through the other way just so that we're opening up exactly the same hole but because we're going to push the needle through from a certain direction that's fine so i'm just going to pop that away next thing we're going to need is some thread so that we can start stitching this up this is a waxed thread. Like I say, it might be synthetic, it might be a, a heavy cotton. I can't remember what it was I bought, but to do the length, the general rule of thumb is, if you're doing something with a welt in it, you're gonna want at least four times the length of the stitch, because you've got that thickness to penetrate as well. And we're not just going down from one side. Saddle stitch means coming at it from both sides. So you basically you roughly wanna take the piece of cord around the full length of the stitch line, okay? We want to leave a couple of inches to go through the needle, so leave a couple of inches on there, around the length of the stitch line, and then I'm going to measure that one, two, three. So we've got four times the length of the stitch we need, and then another few inches just for the needle on the other side. Cut that off. So we've got quite a long piece of thread. So for a sheath this size, it's not going to be a guarantee for anything but you're going to want just probably it's probably about four foot there yeah just over four foot which you would think for something that's only that long is overkill and it will be slight overkill we'll have some left over but trust me I've tried to keep be really efficient with the thread it just makes for really hard work towards the end of the job when you're trying to finish off so leave yourself a little bit of excess cord don't be tight with it now we've got the needles, we're going to need two needles. So we're going to take this wax thread, and this is, you can pinch it a little bit, because the eyes are quite small, but then we've got to thread that through there and pull through two or three inches of thread and then sort of comb it back on itself. And because it's waxed, it kind of sits together quite nicely. Do not tie a knot in it, because that's too bulky to go through the hole. Now we put one on the other end of the cord as well. And again, just sort of flatten the end of that wax thread with your finger to make it, finger and thumbs to make it flat enough to post it through the, the hole, which is slightly slotted. But they're quite a robust eye in these needles. They're much smaller than they would be on a standard sewing needle. So there we go. We've got a pair of needles, about the same tail on each one. And now, of course, that cord looks, that thread looks much shorter than we've got a needle on each end. Now we need to hold this somehow. Now again, if you haven't got this kind of equipment, this is called a stitching pony, and it basically clamps the leather together so you don't have to glue it. And you could just have clamped this up and then used this device and just punched the holes as you go. Some people will literally have a needle and an awl in one hand, punch a hole, stick the needle through it. So there's different ways of doing it. This is just the way I've developed that I, I'm comfortable doing it. So if you haven't got this, this is going to work much better on camera and it's easier to do it for me this way. I used to just pinch it between my knees and do it like this, sitting down somewhere. So that's an option if you haven't got this piece of equipment. But for, because we have, we're going to put it up inside there. Just tighten this clamp up and it stops things moving around too much. And then what I always like to do, saddle stitch you say is going to come from either side. It's a really strong stitch. I start with the second hole from the top, so I basically double up this first stitch. So I'm going to poke one needle all the way through and then make sure I pull this up so I've got the same amount of thread on each side. That's quite important. Then we're going to come back one hole right to the end, take that all the way through, leave a little loop, take the other needle back from the other side and as you're pushing that needle through, pull a bit of the other thread back with it because what can happen 
is halfway through, the needle can kind of pierce the thread. So you can end up going through the thread and then you tie a knot, which you don't want. So with the needle still there, you can pass that needle to the other hand, wrap that thread round the needle once, or twice if you really want to go belt and braces. But we're basically what we're doing with this technique is we're tying inside the leather. You can see when we pull these tight now, try and make sure we've got the same amount again, because it can move. We've effectively tied a little half hitch knot inside. So pull that tight and that helps to cinch that down nicely. And then this is the bit where we might have to wiggle a little bit. We're gonna put that needle in because we've already got a thickness of thread in there. I'm just gonna very gently open that hole up with that needle, come back the other way, pull a bit of thread with it again, round it once, pass the needle from one end to the other, pull it tight. So now we've doubled up that first stitch basically. We're just gonna do singles the rest of the way. Let's carry on like that, through one, through the other, pass it, wrap it, pull it tight. And if you can see, what's happened is where we've cut that little groove, the stitching, when we pull it nice and tight, it's sitting down within that groove now. I can't feel the stitching, it's not proud of the leather. So it's well protected. And even the whole, the whole point of this saddle stitch method is that even if you wear through I guess, you know, saddle stitch because it's used to hold horses' saddles together. They get a lot of friction from the rider and from the horse. So I guess at some point the stitches will wear through. The fact that we're tying this little half hitch knot, we're effectively locking off each stitch. So the point being is if, for example, that bit there got cut, it's not going to mean the whole thing unravels because we've got that, that little knot buried in each one. So each, each stitch is effectively locked off. And once you've had a little bit of practice at this, I'm quite, I would consider myself quite slow at this. I've watched professional leather workers and their hands are a blur. <laughs> so you get a feel for it after a while, but just take your time. Make sure that you don't pierce the thread by pulling that little bit of extra back through with a needle. And again, the diamond shaped hole, when we pull this tight, it pulls the, the thread into the points of the diamond. So that's another feature that actually locks the stitching into place. So this is just stuff I've kind of picked up over the years from various sources, some from experience, some from tutorial videos on YouTube. So if you go and find professional leather workers, they may well suggest alternative ways of doing this, better ways of doing it. And so there was a time when I got told by a I put a video up of doing some stitching and got told by the other worker. I was going around, used to go around twice like this. Now, it still works, you can still pull it in and you've tied a, a tighter knot that's less likely to come undone. They insisted that it was completely unnecessary, so I kind of stopped doing it. They're probably right, they've been doing it longer than me. But if, say, if you really want to go belt and braces, you can go around that needle twice. Right, so now I've done all of the, the straight saddle stitch. Like I say, we could come round here, tuck this in, we could have cut the groove all the way around and carry on with this same method. But the problem is, we've got to go down one side 
and back to go down the other side or we've got to introduce a second piece of thread. So that's part of the reason I developed this other method and I'm just going to turn this up a little bit in this stand so I can see what I'm doing. Hopefully you'll be able to see a bit better too. We just now want to get a finger in there because we're, we're locked off with stitching not just the glue and get a finger in, open that up a bit and you can see now how that's going to fit inside that shape. Okay so the point's going to come right into there and this is a bit where it gets a little, little bit tricky. We could, if we wanted to get really technical about it, we could introduce a really thin line of glue, try and set that up um, and let it stick fast. In my experience, because, it's, because of the way you're working, it just doesn't really work like that. So what I've found is the best is to get the initial couple of stitches in just to secure this in place. And the way I do that, I'm just going to nip this up a little bit more. You want to come a bit, now we've come down to this point, you want to come a bit closer to the edge. So we're coming in, uh, towards the edge from our groove. And we're going to go in like that. We're going to come in at a bit of an angle. So we want to come up in through that, through this leather and into this little flap. Okay, now this is where the champagne cork comes in because I can use that to kind of hold this down in place and not worry about stabbing my finger because I've got this bit of cork in between me and the, the awl. So I'm going to come up at an angle, which is why I needed this to be like up out of the clamp a little bit, otherwise it gets in the way. So I'm now through that the outside piece of leather, make sure this is going to line up, introduce the bit of cork on top to press through into, and just try and make sure we're going to come through the right place before we commit to it. So make sure this is in position. Just find the point of that hole. I just want to make sure the point's coming through. I'm going to try and do this so you can see. So I'm going to get it in just a little bit, right? So I can see now the point's coming through. It looks exactly where I want it to be. So now I can put the cork on and just sort of commit to that by pushing it through into the cork, saving any chance of getting my hand. Now that can come out. I'm going to put that away for a second. And just to secure this in place, I'm going to come in through that hole, hold this down where it wants to be, Follow the, follow the line that the oil went through and just pull that in like that. So that now secures that in place, or at least roughly. I can hold down that down. Now I'm going to come along about a similar spacing to what we did on the other side. Again, push through and try and aim. This is all going to be done by eye. We're going to try and aim to keep basically a rough kind of line around here. I'll just mark that with the thumbnail so you can see what's going on. I'm going to try and hit that line now, basically. So I can put a finger either side of it. Maybe come that way a bit so you can see. Try and hit it on that line or as close as I can get to it. Get the cork in place. Push it all the way through. Now it comes again. And this, is a, this one will actually kind of lock it in a bit more. So we're going to go straight over the top and back in through that hole again. And that's the one that will kind of lock this down. Now at this point we could start the opposite side because obviously we've got, where we've done the saddle stitch down the length, you can kind of see where this is going. We're going to go down and back and then down and back again. So what I'm going to show you here is just this one side. So come across at a similar sort of angle and mark roughly where the next hole wants to be. And again, what we're doing, because we've got this slight diagonal, we're pushing in through the side, but then slightly forwards on the top part. So try and keep a similar stitch spacing. It just makes it look neater as a finished job. Now what you can do at this point, now we've got this sort of secured reasonably well, you don't have to keep stopping and putting this stitch through because now we've got a couple of stitches in. Try and put a reasonably even tension on these so they sit nicely and hold this seam. But now I can tuck that back out the way and actually I can just say, right, well that's the spacing. So I can just use the last hole as a guide, come through, find my point, in through there. And then I can just move it along another stitch width. Same again from the outside, pointing forward slightly. And again, so dependent on the size of the blade that you need to house and 
how big a flap you've had to put in to expand the, the end will depend on how many stitches you're going to need here. I just need to loosen this off a little bit so I can see what I'm doing. Just a little bit more clearance there. And I reckon we're only going to need two more holes potentially. I'm just trying to keep a reasonably even space in it, just makes it look neat. One there. And you want to get one quite close to the end, so it's sort of proper seal that in. That's good to me. Right, so now we've done that, we've got all the holes that we need. Still got plenty of thread left, so we're going to go up through there. The reason I'd like to try and keep this all in place nicely is because once you start doing this stitch you can pull one hole out of line with the next so sometimes it's difficult to find the same way through that the awl picked. The awl's sharp, the needle's not, so this needle will not poke its way through this leather, it's way too thick and strong. But try and get an even tension on all of them through that last one and then we're going to go back the opposite way. So we're going to come through this last hole again. So we've gone through this once to that hole, now we're coming through it again and that will seal off that end and start us on our return journey so we're going to cross over. Okay, So we're coming through here the same way that we did before, so you're taking the same path and I can just see that I've caught the thread there, I don't know if the camera will pick that, I'm going to try and avoid that. Right, so then all the way through and try as you pull this tight to make sure they cross over on the seam, so we're going to get this kind of cross stitch pattern. But we are following exactly the same path as we did on the way, it's just because we're coming backwards they're crossing over. You can cinch these down nice and tight. You can see now where it looked like we had loads and loads of excess thread by the time we've done a double, double stitch all the way down, that saddle stitch all the way down coming from both sides and then we've done the same going back this way, what's going to happen is I'm just going to come back to here and this is the one that's going to be slightly tricky probably because it may well have moved since we were here the first time found it okay you might just have to manipulate this a little bit to get there and there we are so basically we're done what I am going to do to finish this off properly is actually go back through that hole and do another saddle stitch when I've done this side but that's giving you the idea so I think you can see now we haven't got loads of thread left over just what was the tail that was through there and enough to finish off comfortably without it being really fiddly and tight so we'll leave it at that we'll stitch this side up off off a camera and then I'll show you just how to finish it off So we've come back down the other side now and I've got a little bit of thread left so what we're going to do is the same as before, we're going to come back through this hole that we started at and we're going to try and saddle stitch this. Now this is where it's going to be a little bit tight because we've already been through it the once but what I don't really want to do is go at it again with the awl because the awl is quite sharp on the side, it might cut the, the stitch that's already existing so I'm just opening up these holes which is a bit awkward from this angle but just want to open these up a little bit with the needles and then I'm going to try and come all the way through from that side and out of this side. Bearing in mind these holes don't exactly line up. So this is the one we're aiming for there and this is the one we're aiming for there. So if you see they're at slightly opposing angles. So I've got to kind of get the needle in and then try and bend it a little bit to try and find this hole as an exit. Hopefully there we go. And this is where sometimes this will be really tight so you might find that it's too tight to kind of pull it through with your fingers but we got away with that. So sometimes you might just need to grab hold of the end of the or actually grab sort of like up here on the needle with a little pair of pliers just to pull that through. We want to leave a little bit of slack here but pull out the loose end so that's not clogging up the hole because we're already quite tight for space. And this one goes back through, hopefully this will be a bit easy because we've already been through once, here it comes. And this is where again we want to make sure that we pull a bit of thread back so that we're not 
puncturing that thread. Can you see that we are? In fact, look, there's a perfect example. That needle has gone through the middle of the thread. That is definitely something we don't want because it would have stopped us from pulling the knot up tight. So we unhook it from the end. That's why we pull a bit of thread back. Bear in mind we've already been through this hole. It's all tight in there and the needle's found its way through. Now this is the time when I will go around twice. Pull this all the way out. And then we'll pull this up nice and tight. So we've basically doubled that last stitch up. We've got the saddle stitch on the inside. It's all nice and tight. And at that point, we just want our little knife back. I'm gonna pull that tight. Just trim off any excess. Being careful not to mar the, the leather as we do it. It's fine if you leave a tiny little tail because we can always just sort of singe that back with a lighter again, but they'll, they'll just sit back into the, into the holes. We've got a nice finish there. All that remains to be done is to finish this edge now. So we could just go straight on with a burnisher, but what's quite nice, and this could have been done while the material's flat, but after the, the groove had been cut, is just to come back down here with the old beveling tool. So we're gonna take that off there. Obviously don't go all the way around to the point because we've got in, into our new stitch territory there. So from this side again, just going to come round, starting on the bend, follow that round. Remember, saliva is the best thing for this job. Then we can go in this thicker groove here and just start rubbing until we start to get that nice sheen and we finish it off and it just flushes everything up nice. It's a nice durable finish. There's various shapes you can see I've cut into this just to give me the different finishes that I'm going to want on various thicknesses of leather. And you can keep, keep applying the saliva and you're basically going to burnish it all to it's dry anyway. So just the enzymes that are in there to help you digest food also help to slick the leather up really nice. Okay, so we've got that all burnished now. Now moment of truth is does the tool fit? So this was the home that it's in is an alternative method which we'll look at another time. So the whole point of this is that the tool pushes in, it stretches the leather but without cutting it because we're on the sides of the tool and it's going to go all the way down and the first time it's going to be tight. This is why we make it a bit on the tight side. So that's dropping in now because it's nice tight fit around the handle, nice tight fit around the tool. You can see where this pinch here is what enables that to kind of get in and we can manipulate this a little bit now just to give it the shape that we want. And one of the reasons I actually stopped making these is because I saw quite a few people, because of this shape of the tool and this shape on here, they were putting the tool in like this. And all that's gonna happen, although it will technically fit, you're gonna end up rubbing the edge on the inside of the leather. So it's gonna mar up the inside of the leather and also it's gonna dull the edge because we know that we use leather to strop a tool. So if you rub it across it, it's gonna have the opposite effect. What you will find eventually is you wear two kind of little tram lines on the inside. They might even be starting to be visible now where you can see it's just sort of like started to catch a little bit, but that'll, that'll sort of get set in by the tool as it's been put in and out a few times. And as long as you're sensible about how you do it and you don't wriggle it in, you're not gonna cut the sheath or do the actual edge any harm. So that's that one. Another option for you.
Just one last thing to mention. Um, we've just used raw, as it comes, veg tan leather. No dyes applied, nothing. It's just as it's come from the tannery. Um, so the, the, the minimum you're going to want to do is oil it or wax it. I've actually run out of the recommended oil, which is neats for oil. Um, you don't want anything that's really going to polymerize or go off. So what I've got here is just the sort of stuff that you're going to put on your on your walking boots, really. Um, and we're just going to put a little bit of this as a wax. So we're just going to rub it on. If you wanted to change the color of this leather, you could dye it as well, that would be an option. And that's really best done while the material's still flat. You can get a much more even coat. Um, and then obviously you're not gonna start trying to dye the, the stitching. And if you've done contrasting stitch colors, then that would look a bit odd if you then dyed it afterwards. But you can, you know, technically I could apply dye now, but this is just gonna add a little bit of a protective layer. It helps to sort of feed the leather and keep it supple for years to come. And then if you've done it like this, you can reapply this like you would to your boots and we just rub that in. If you applied a little bit of heat to this as well, it helps it soak in, but it's generally just the, you can see it sort of darkening up a little bit as I'm rubbing it. Just the heat from rubbing it in. Gonna get a nice coat of wax on there. And that will just help to protect it. And say, so keep it nice and supple. So there you have it, my friends. That's a wrap for this video. Lee, thank you so much. You're welcome, mate. It's good now, fun. I will stress this, obviously, out of the entire series, this is probably the more intricate one, shall we say? Yeah, it's a little bit complicated. Um, but again, if you've got the kind of tool that's going to benefit from it, it's, it's a nice, easy way to store that kind of tool because it's just in and out. There's no pegs or closures to mess about no. with. So, and it's, yeah, it's a nice protective way, but it's a challenge. Yeah. We like a challenge. The main thing being it forms part of this wider series that we're doing to cover the the most popular, shall we say, styles of sheets that are out there. Um, and so a quick recap and things that I mentioned throughout this video and at the beginning. So first things first is, as Lee mentioned during the video, I'm gonna put some pictures on a blog post I've done to a company. Uh, this video that you're watching right now. And a link to that blog post will be down below in the description. Now on that blog post, what you're gonna be able to see is some close up pictures of the templates that, that Lee used. And as Lee stressed during the video itself, it's not something you work with directly, but generally it's a visual guide for you to then obviously curate your own template with which you can work from and create your own shape. Would you say that's a, that's a fair yeah, thing to say? It's certainly a good guide, isn't it? It's a starting yeah. point. You might have to modify it slightly to suit the particular tool you're working with, but you gotta start somewhere. Yeah, and as mentioned, <laughs> obviously during the video as well, it's best to make a template from a piece of like lino, flooring, uh, cardboard, etc. So the key thing being, you're not wasting good leather, okay, trying to work out the best fit for your particular style of sheath. And obviously Lee touched on in detail, the style of sheath, this particular, uh, sorry, the style of spoon knife, this particular style of sheath will be compatible with. So if you want a recollection of that, then obviously you can rewind back uh, to the video uh, using the timeline feature. Uh, another couple of things to stress is I'm gonna put a link below to all the videos that are part of this broader series that will be done before this one that you're watching now and the ones that obviously go after it. So links below will be those also. Also what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a link to Lee's website. You can go there, find out more information about the work that he does. And he also has a newsletter, an email newsletter you can sign up for. They would highly encourage you to do. And from time to time, email, uh, Lee will email you out, letting you know the kind of myriad of the things that he's got going on. As well as his link to his website, I'm also gonna put a link to his Instagram profile. On there you can see a myriad of work that he does in case you're not already familiar with kind of what Lee does day to day. So like I said, links to everything that I outlined below. And Lee, are there any parting words from yourself? Well, I think we're good. That was it. Another job done. That was it. Making inroads into the series, guys. <laughs> so guys, hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, appreciate you watching all the way through if you have done so. And as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Lee Stoffer and myself, Zed Outdoors, peace out.